It seems like on a weekly basis, I find myself meeting with several individuals, and they're joyful meetings with the agenda of trying to get our minds wrapped around what is the Bible all about. I mean, imagine for a moment, you had never been equipped with a robust understanding of, of what's this Bible all about? How's it start? How's it end? What's, what's the basic message of Christianity? And so it's with joy that I enter into these meetings. And early on in these meetings, we inevitably come to the third chapter of Genesis. It's such a critical chapter to understand the entirety of the scriptures. Adam and Eve rebel. Humanity plunges into the fall. As a byproduct of human rebellion, sin, sickness, death enter into the world. And in that dark moment, though, God speaks. And as God pronounces a curse upon humanity, God also, in that curse, plants a beautiful promise. Genesis 3.15, God says the following. I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman, Eve. Between the serpent's seed and her seed. The seed of the woman, he, will bruise the head of the serpent. And yet the serpent will bruise the seed's heel. This prophecy sets a trajectory upon which the rest of the scriptures and human history will tread. All throughout the book of Genesis, all throughout what we call the Old Testament, you will have a tracing of the seeds. Who is the righteous seed of Eve? We find all these stories about particular men whether it be Abel, or Noah, or Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. A tracing of the seed. And the reason we're tracing the seed is because the message of the Bible is this. All is not lost. Yes, we live in a world of sin, sickness, and death. A world of misery on so many levels. There is hope. God who made us has not abandoned us. God, through this great promise of one day raising up or sending a seed, God will crush the serpent, effectively lifting the curse. And yet there's that subtle reminder that this promised one who does come, this promised one who does crush the serpent, he is significantly wounded in the process. His heel is crushed. And so if you're reading the Bible well, you will move past Genesis 3, and you'll be reading the Bible through the lens of, could this be the seed? Is this the seed? So it shouldn't surprise us that in all of these Old Testament histories, these Old Testament narratives, the characters in their life, conduct, words, foreshadow in some way, they predict or point to in some way, the ultimate seed who is to come from our perspective, who has come, and that is Jesus. At this point in our journey through Daniel, I think that it's pretty clear that Daniel is a prophet who prefigures Jesus Christ. Already in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we've seen so many parallels between the life of Daniel, a seed, and the life of Jesus, the seed. The seed who came, lived, and died for our sins. The seed who rose. The seed who crushed the serpent. The seed who lifts the curse. The seed in whom your hope and my hope today rests securely. 
But I want for a moment, by way of introduction, to remind you, because not everyone who approaches the Scripture is accustomed to the discipline when they're in the Old Testament of doing what we ought to do, and that is compare the Old Testament character to the true seed who did come, and that is Jesus Christ, and see in what ways are they similar. Because whether you believe it or not, as we are informed in the New Testament, if you're a Christian today, it is God's purpose for your life to be a mirroring, to be a reflection of Jesus yourself. So just as the Old Testament characters should point us to Jesus, so a New Testament character, me, you, when people look at us, as they are familiar with us, and then they read the story of Jesus, they should see a whole lot of parallels. He's loving, you're loving. He's gracious, you're gracious. He's passionate for holiness. You're passionate for holiness. He fears God. You fear God. He dies to self to serve others. You die to self to serve others. He's persecuted for living righteously. You're persecuted for living righteously. He, for the joy set before him, endures the cross. You, for the joy set before you, endure your suffering. You see? So I want to pause for a moment. For those that, that maybe you're here for the very first time, you, you have no clue where we're at in the book of Daniel, this will be helpful for you. I want to ask a couple questions to establish this concept of typology, this concept of establishing parallels. What I'm saying this morning by way of introduction is that Daniel is a Bible character whose life establishes a pattern that points to the life of Jesus Christ. If you were to be asked, who is Daniel? I would suggest that you respond with a statement that kind of sounds like this. He's a blameless. That's Daniel 1.8. Spirit-filled. Daniel 4.9. Son of David. Daniel 1.3 whose life is characterized by obedience, Daniel 5.11, faith, Hebrews 11, and the fear of God, chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. That's a great reduction of the life of Daniel. And we're talking very broadly. Similarly, if someone asked, well, who is Jesus? This Jesus character that, that you're claiming all of Scripture points to, that you're claiming the Old Testament's look forward to, and if you're in the New Testament post-Jesus, we're to point back to, we're to reflect him to. Who is this person upon all human history rotates? Who is this axis? I would suggest to you that the pages of Scripture inform us that Jesus was a greater blameless. 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Spirit-filled, John 3.34, for he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for God has given to him the spirit without measure. He is a greater blameless, spirit-filled son of David, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, son of Abraham. Jesus was a greater, blameless, spirit-filled son of David whose life is characterized by obedience. John 8, 29, I do always those things that are pleasing to him. Whose life is characterized by faith. Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He believed there would be a reward for his suffering, and his faith in that reward fueled his obedience. Therefore, in Romans 3, we are saved by the faith of Jesus. We're saved by his faith, his obedience, his cross work. And his life is characterized by the fear of God. Matthew 10, 28, here's what Jesus taught. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, 
fear him, his father, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, as we approach Daniel chapter 6, here's the challenge. On one hand, I've got potentially some who have maybe never been exposed to Daniel in the lion's den. And on the other hand, I have some who you recognize this is in the Holy Trinity of Sunday School Tales. Like, like there's nothing new that I can tell you about this story. You, you already know it. Inside, outside, forward, backwards. So the challenge before us this morning is great. But the way that I would like to approach this chapter is to suggest to you Something that, for those that are very, very familiar, you've likely never seen. Something, for those that are brand new, hopefully you'll love to see. And that is, when we get to Daniel chapter 6, what was vague, and I have to pause for a minute and say, up to this point, the parallels that I've established between Daniel and Jesus, they're fairly vague. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that when we hit Daniel 6 and we get on that interstate, we put our pedal to the metal and we begin to see in a wonderful way that Daniel, to a degree that we've never ascertained before, Daniel prefigures and points to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus like we've never understood before. It's glorious. Broadly speaking, I want you to see that Daniel chapter 6, it's much more than just a lion's den. Let's go to Lord and ask for his help. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, there is no way I can meet the sole need of each individual. Our backgrounds are too diverse. Our burdens are so varied. But there is one today named Jesus, your son, who is able. He has that type of power. He can meet every single individual where they're at today, and he can help them. For some, he could save their soul from hell. For others, he can rescue them from addiction. For a few, he can completely transform their character, thus saving their marriage and their relationship with that child. Lord, may, may the magnificence of Jesus be exalted through the life of Daniel, and may this be a template that you play out in our lives, that our lives would model, point to, and demonstrate the superiority of Jesus Christ. We pray this for your honor and glory. Amen. You're going to stay in Daniel 6. As we go through this, if you're willing to write in your Bible, what I'd like for you to do is to mark in your margin at every point in Daniel chapter 6 where I highlight for you that Daniel prefigures or points to Jesus I'd like for you to just make that little notation so that next time you come to this book, next time you find yourself in chapter 6, you don't miss what is the ultimate aim of all Scripture, seeing Jesus, being drawn to Jesus, being stirred in your faith towards Jesus. We'll begin in Daniel 6, 1 through 4. We're not going to read every verse, we're just going to hit the highlights. Daniel 6, 1 through 4, follow along with me. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes. And over these three high officials, three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, he was one of them. That the princes might give accounts unto them, and that the king should have no damage. 
Then this Daniel was preferred above all the high officials, all the presidents, all the princes, all the satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. So by way of introduction, here's what we find. Daniel's a man of obedience, integrity. He's a man that can be trusted. He's a politician who's not corrupt. He's a person who sincerely serves for the good of the community. I say, Daniel for president. Amen? Now watch this. There are many others that are bothered, though, because they understand that Daniel is beloved by Darius. There's an envy, there's a jealousy in these other officials, particularly when the gossip gets out that Daniel is likely to be appointed as the chief of the chiefs. So look what happens in verse 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. We're going to smear him and ruin his campaign. You and I are used to this type of politics. What I want you to see by way of first parallel, Daniel was conspired against by jealous peers. Do you have that in your mind? Is it locked in? Now watch. Similarly, our Lord Jesus, in his life and ministry, he too was conspired against by jealous peers. Listen carefully to this. John eleven forty seven 47 through 50 says, Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the council, and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs, and, and if we let him go on like this, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Oh no. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, he said, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that here's what we should do. It's expedient that one man die for the people rather than the whole nation perish. There in John 11, we find the peers of Jesus jealously conspiring towards his death. Back to Daniel 6. Back to verse 4. But they could find none occasion nor fault in Daniel. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. He's squeaky clean. I mean, you can't dig up any dirt. No corruption. No fraud. He's completely genuine. He passes their examination, and they're frustrated by it. In fact, look at verse 5. We're not going to be able to find any occasion against this guy except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Like, the only way to get this guy is to somehow pit him and his theology, his religion, somehow we have to pit him against the king. That's the only way to undo this guy. So I want you to see clearly in this text, Daniel was examined, but notice this, he was found to be faithful, he was found to be innocent of all charges. So too, you got to see this, Jesus, he, remember, though they're conspiring against him, they want to kill him. Jesus, when brought under examination, he too was found to be faithful and declared to be innocent. Listen, Luke records it well. The words of Pilate, verses 14 and 15. You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. So at Jesus' trial, he was declared to be innocent, faithful. Let's go to Daniel 6, verse 7. These conspirators come to King Darius proposing that King Darius, for a 30-day period, enacts a new law. Let's look at what the law will say in verse 7. 
all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute, to make a firm decree that whoever shall ask a petition to any god or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of the lions. Here's what they're basically saying. O oh, king, you're so great. For a 30-day period to test everyone's loyalty, you alone are going to serve as a human priest. So if anyone wants to pray to their God, they must seek you. They must petition you, and you then can pray to their God, because you are high above all of us. Now, now their plot is to pit Daniel against his God. What I want you to see here, the accusation that is going to be made against Daniel, I mean in verse 10, no sooner does the ink dry on the new decree, and verse 10, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows were opened to his chamber towards Jerusalem, and he kneeled upon his knees his knees, three times a day, and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he did a fourth time. He didn't suddenly become spiritual. See, see, this is very different than the parallel story of Daniel 3. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Their test is a test of whether or not they will sin by way of commission. Will they do something actively against God? Bow to the idol. That's their test. Here in Daniel 6, there's so much that's similar, but here's what's different. Daniel is not being tested by a sin of commission. Daniel is being tested by a sin of omission. Will he stop doing what he knows is right? What he knows is good? Will he, for fear of man and preservation of self, turn away from his faithful dependence upon God? That's the test. What they're doing effectively is making it to where he's going to be guilty of rebellion against the high king. Likewise, do you know that's exactly what they do to Jesus? They can't find any fault in Jesus. Everyone who examines him declares him to be innocent. So what do they do with the trial of Jesus? Listen to this. Luke 23, 2. They began to accuse Jesus, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Hogwash! He said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render to God the things that are God. False accusations. But what are they carefully doing? Pitting him against the high king. He's an insurrectionist, a rebel. He must be put down. saying that he himself is Christ, a king. John 19, 12 records it this way. As a result of this, Pilate made every effort to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king, which this man does, opposes Caesar. Let's go back to Daniel. Let's look at verse 14. One of the unique character traits about the Medo-Persian Empire is they had this quirky rule that once a law was enacted, it could not be undone. Therefore, one must be very careful about the laws one enacts. What we find in verse 14 is that Darius has remorse. He realizes he's been duped. He realizes that he has a beloved, faithful, loyal administrator within his kingdom who he must now execute. And here's what he goes through for a whole evening. Darius tries to find some sort of legal loophole. But in the end, the conspirators remind Darius, you cannot alter this law. Look at verse 14. Then the king, when he had heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. In Daniel's trial, the king sought desperately to release Daniel, but he ends up being unsuccessful. So in Jesus' trial, Pilate, which is the local authority, 
He seeks desperately to release Jesus, but he is unsuccessful. Listen to this. It's striking. Matthew 27, while Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with this righteous man, Jesus. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, well, what do I do with this man called Jesus, the Christ? They said, crucify him. And he said, well, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. And he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. Themselves. Compare that to what Luke records. Pilate summoned the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. Behold, I've examined him before you. I find no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to me. And behold, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they cried out all together, saying, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept calling out, crucify him, crucify him. And he said to him the third time, why, what evil has he done? I have found no guilt demanding death, therefore I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices asking that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail, and Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted, and he delivered Jesus to their will. We're not finished yet. Daniel is sentenced to die. He'll be thrown into a pit of hungry lions. The king is present for this execution. I want you to see in this next scripture that the king says to Daniel, and, and I believe it's very rooted in unbelief, it's one of those awkward moments where the king, talking to one of his friends, he doesn't know what to say, so he just says something that seems encouraging. Have you ever been there? Maybe someone that you love is really struggling physically. Maybe they've been given a terminal pronouncement from a doctor. You don't really know how to handle it. You don't really know what to say, and so you might say to that loved one with an arm around them, you, you hug them and you say, oh, don't worry, it's going to be okay. You don't believe that for a moment, but you just don't know what else to say. Through the king's actions throughout the night, because he doesn't eat and he tosses and turns, and through what he says when he comes to the lion's den the next morning, it's evident that King Darius doesn't believe what he's about to say, but I want you to listen carefully to what he says. He says in Daniel 6.16, Thy God, whom you serve continually, Daniel, he will deliver you. Sure. I think, I hope, maybe. But then as he walks away, he's toast. Some translations render it as a question. It could go either way. It may be that he said, I, I hope, may your God deliver you. He, he does not have faith. He's just hoping. I mean, after all, how can a man be delivered from hungry lions? Now, here's what I want you to see. The chief priests, scribes, and elders of Judea jeer out of an unbelieving heart against Jesus, mocking him with a claim that perhaps God will deliver him from his lion's den, the cross. Listen to this from Matthew 27. In the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him, he saved others, but he can't save himself. And I reach a point where my notes have suddenly gotten out of order. Give me a moment. A mysterious page has disappeared.
Israel. That's the one bad thing about manuscripting your sermon. Okay. Here we go. Found it. Let him come down now from the cross. We'll have to just edit that little clip out. (laughs) And we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants. For he said, I am the son of God. Do you see how they jeered? Rooted in unbelief. Back to Daniel. Look at verses 16 and 17. He's been sentenced to death. I want you to see it. He's thrown into the lion's den. Now watch this. Now some of you already know where we're going to go from here, but just let it, let it sink in. Enjoy it. A stone is rolled over the entrance of the lion's den, and then it's sealed with the king's signet. Let me read from the text in Daniel, verse 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said to Daniel, Thy God, whom you serve us continually, he will deliver you, I hope. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. No one's going to mess with that stone. Listen carefully. Jesus, having been executed upon the cross, is placed into the garden tomb. A stone is then rolled against the entrance and sealed with the seal of the temple guards. Matthew 27 records it. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud, and he laid it in his own tomb, which he had cut in the rock. The next day, that is, after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate, and here's what they said. Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And that last fraud, it will be even worse than the first fraud. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go and make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure. How? By sealing it with a stone and setting a guard. Back to Daniel chapter 6, verse 19. Here's what we find. Daniel is raised to life from the lion's den in demonstration and vindication of his righteousness. So pay careful attention to Daniel and what he says as he's being lifted up out of this lion's den. Look carefully at the text, starting in verse 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning, and he went to haste to the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake, and he said, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you serve continually? Is he really able to deliver you from the lions? Awkward silence. If I was Daniel in that moment, I would have heightened the suspense by remaining quiet. Just let that tension hang for a while. Then Daniel says to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel, and he has shut the lion's mouths, and they have not heard us. For as much as before him, look at this, innocency was found in me. Also before you, O king, I have done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. Now watch this. So Jesus rose alive out of the garden tomb in demonstration of his righteousness. Listen to Luke 24. On the first day of the week at the early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they didn't find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in a dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told to you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise? Now, for most people, they think the story ends here. 
Because after all, is Daniel not out of the tomb? The lion's mouths have been shut and they happily live ever after. But notice we've not come to the end of chapter 6. And I want you to know this, and this might be the most satisfying part, and it might be the most important thing for us to consider today, that what happens next in the text also prefigures Christ. And friend, I say this with all the love that I can say. What happens next prefigures all those who stand in opposition to Christ. And friends, you may not realize it, but you were born a rebel. You were born hating God. You were born denying his lordship over your life. You are already condemned, already under his wrath. There's no neutrality when it comes to God or Jesus. You're for him or against him, and you came into this world against him. And if you remain against him, all those who stand against the greater than Daniel will likewise perish. Look what happens in Daniel, and then look what happens in the life of Jesus. See it. Let it sink in, and let it provoke fear in your heart. Daniel 6, verse 25. No, verse 24. And the king commanded, and they brought those men that had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives and the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they another way to translate it as soon as they before they hit the floor of the den evidently the lion fast ended it became a lion feast it's not daniel who's perishing it's those who oppose daniel And just as the men who conspired against Daniel are destroyed, those men, you, I, anyone who conspires against Jesus, who refuses to accept his lordship, who lives in proud rebellion, anyone who conspires against submission to the true high king, they will be destroyed. Now, here's what I want you to see. This isn't just something that we look to the future. I want you to see in history that the very people who conspired against Jesus, God saw to it to destroy them. Now, we're going to look to a parable that Jesus spoke, and then we're going to tie it to a historical event. Listen to this parable. It happens right before his death. Jesus speaks in Matthew 22. Here's what he says. The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who gave a feast for his son. Are you following me so far? So Jesus is talking about this parable. It's like the kingdom of heaven. Picture a king throwing a feast for his son. The king references God. The son references who? Jesus. Now watch this. He sent his servants to call those who are invited to the wedding feast. But watch this. They would not come. That represents Israel. They've been invited. My king is here. Receive him. They're not interested. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But no matter how many servants the king sent, they kept rejecting the message. They paid no attention to it and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Now watch this. The king was angry. This is Jesus telling the story. It's, it's a parable, but it's also a prophecy. The king was angry, and he sent his troops, and he destroyed those murderers and he burned their city. Now after he finishes his parable, he says, we, we're going to call this drop the mic moment. Truly I say to all of you, all these things will come upon this generation. 
and history records in A.D. 70, the future Roman emperor, Titus, in a merciless fashion, tears down Jerusalem's walls, burns the city to the ground, and executes all the chief priests and elders and Israelite officials. You might call it coincidence. Christ calls it a prophetic prefigurement of what happens when you conspire against God's Son. Many would think, okay, we got to be done, right? But are we done in Daniel 6? Notice there's one final little detail of the story, and you might think it insignificant, but it's not, and it parallels Jesus, so let's cover it. Look at verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all peoples, nations, languages that dwell on the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom that will, will not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So our final comparison now let this sink in. It's a, it's, it's a little bit wordy, but let it sink in. After Daniel's resurrection, after being lifted up out of the lion's den, what happens? Well, not only are his conspirators executed, but next, the good news is proclaimed to all peoples, nations, and men of every language. The God of Daniel is the living God. I mean, it's proclaimed throughout all the land. The God of Daniel is the living God. His kingdom is forever. It will not be destroyed. He performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, and he has proven this. How do we know this is true? Here's what Darius says. Here's the proof. Daniel got raised out of the lion's den. Are you there? Got it in your mind? Now, I'm going to give you the parallel, and we're going to close with a scripture. After Jesus' resurrection, what happens? We're going to, in a moment, move to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to find the good news is proclaimed. To all peoples, all nations, men of every language, the God of Jesus is the living God. And he will pardon anyone who turns from their sin and submits to Jesus. His kingdom is forever. It will not be destroyed. He performs signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. And he has proven this by delivering his son from the power of death. I'm going to read to you from Acts 2. Now, now, now hear carefully. This is the very first Christian sermon preached at an event called Pentecost, Peter, one of the closest disciples of Jesus, stands up on this occasion. They're at the temple. They have been miraculously speaking in languages that they have previously not known, learned, or studied. A crowd has gathered to marvel at this amazing sign and wonder. And notice what Peter says. And keep this parallel in your mind. Notice what Peter says. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my word. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's just the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. On my male servants and female servants, in those days I'll pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens, signs on the earth. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, now look where Peter goes. Listen carefully. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, 
delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and you killed by the hands of lawless men, God has raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by them. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to David that he would not set one of his that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this to you that you are seeing and hearing. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Jesus Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And the crowd responds with this. What will you have us to do? What will you have us to do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And you too will receive the Holy Ghost. Here's the aim of my message today. Jesus wasn't joking on the road to Emmaus when he said to the disciples, all of Scripture speaks of me. Some people, and I think this is a tragedy, they'll preach Daniel chapter 6 with a theme like this. We need more Daniels. I agree. We need more Daniels in our homes, our workplaces, neighborhoods, marriages. We need more Daniels, men and women of integrity, men and women who are blameless, spirit-filled, known for their obedience, faith, fear of God. I, I agree with all of this. Here's the main ultimate point that Daniel points us to. You and I will never be Daniel-like men or women apart from one person, Jesus Christ. Only Jesus has the power to make men and women new. Only Jesus conquered death. Only Jesus paid for our sins. Only Jesus has been given a name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every name can be saved. Only Jesus. What I'm saying this morning is Christ is greater than Daniel. And it's only through Christ and you and I entering into his covenant that we will be transformed into Daniel-like, Christ-like sons and daughters of God. You are either part of his covenant or you stand against his covenant and you will be destroyed. Flee from the wrath to come. And Christian, center your life upon Jesus. Center your life upon his teachings. Your soul will never flourish apart from him. Let's pray. Father, commercials trick us into thinking that happiness is found in a new car, updated technology, fancy vacations, sexual pleasure, parties, entertainment, and yet we know by way of experience that all of those wells are empty. They only enslave and destroy. Thank you for presenting to us your son. 
submission to your son, it does enslave. It wonderfully enslaves. But it enslaves without destruction. It brings fulfillment, flourishing, life, hope, joy, love, peace. Lord, I pray for our church that there would be a high view of Jesus. He is not just the Savior of the world. He is the King, already seated in the heavenlies. His power is great and His name is terrible. And one day He will come back to this world in judgment and all who oppose Him, in defiance or indifference, will be slain. Lord, increase our loyalty to King Jesus. Increase our deep conviction that it is only through seeking Him and His righteousness that we will be satisfied. Lord, I pray if there's someone today that's never bowed the knee to Christ, that even today, before they leave this place, right now as they're seated, that they would bow their heart to Him. As we think back to Daniel 1 through 6, may we never see it the same. May we, may we no longer miss all the signs that point us to your Son. And may our lives function as Daniel 6, pointing others to him as well. I pray for your blessing as we leave this place. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen.